Hello, everybody. So the title of my talk is Introduction to PyOpenCL. Actually, I will first give an introduction for my personal motivation for interest in PyOpenCL. And then I will talk about PyOpenCL and then a library that I wrote on top of it that could be useful. Uh, so this is the content. So motivation, PyOpenCL. I will give you an example of a 2D Laplace solver written with PyOpenCL. And MDPCL is the library that I wrote recently that works with PyOpenCL. Uh, so my motivation is that for a long time I've been working on what's called Lattice QCD, Lattice Quantum Chromodynamics. So i just explain briefly what that is. I need to go through these steps. So what's a quantum field theory? What's a standard model of particle physics? What's QCD and what's Lattice QCD? Uh, so in the 1700s people came up with classical mechanics. Every system can be described by a Lagrangian and you describe things with the position and velocity of the components. So classical mechanics describe, describe things which are macroscopic and slow. Then Einstein extended that to systems which are macroscopic and fast. And then he also extended it to uh, gravitation, but we're not interested in that. And, and then various people, including uh, Dirac here, built quantum mechanics in which they extended classical mechanics to things that are slow but microscopic. And then Feynman and other people extended both special relativity and quantum mechanics to systems which can be small, large, microscopic, microscopic, fast, slow, and that's called the quantum field theory. It tells you that you don't predict the trajectories of the particles, you compute the probability that given a state, you end up in another state. And you compute that by evaluating all possible evolutions of the system and you weight them. And uh, if you take this mathematical formalism and you apply it to our universe, you get what's called the standard model of particle physics. And it, it includes a description of electromagnetism, what's called weak interactions, and strong interactions. And uh, weak interactions, strong interactions are responsible for atomic decay. That's it. That's a standard model of particle physics that's all there. Uh, some people have seen it before, I guess. And uh, what it is, it's, uh, it tells you that uses this language of the Lagrangian, which is like 200, 300 years old, and gives you a big formula in which each term is, describes a type of particle, and you have a sum of products. And uh, so it's can, you can read it like that, it's fine. It's just a sum of products, and uh, each symbol represents a type of particle. So we have uh, how many? Six quarks, six leptons and uh, four forces, so it's six, six, 12 plus four is 16 basic particles. This plus one, it's called the Higgs, which they just found it. And lots of people got the Nobel Prize for that. And each line is a product, and the product here is telling you that you can get an electron, you can make another electron and a photon. Another one tells you that you can take an electron and you can make a neutrino and a W. Another one tells you that you can take a quark and you can make another type of quark and a gluon, okay? That's what it tells you. And this is what I work on, okay? This is what I've been working on most of my life. This, this line is what we call quantum chromodynamics. Why is it interesting? Because everything else we understand very well, it's very simple, does not give rise to much structure. This gives rise to almost all the structure that we see in the universe, almost all the particles that people find is because of that. So people build machines that cost billions of dollars to check that. They make all kinds of new particles. They're not new. They're just a consequence of that formula. And that's tested to 10 to minus 18 meters. So uh, the goal is people want to compare theory, which is that formula, with the results of the experiments. And to do that, people need a lot of computing power. And uh, so people want to solve differential equations. With that model, basically, to solve it, you need to solve differential equations. And you have to invert very large sparse matrices. So, and it turns out that a lot, a lot of problems in science are solving differential equations and inverting sparse matrices. So that's what we want to do. OK. So we need big computers. And uh, this is the Moore laws. And what it tells you, it tells you that every 18 months, computing power doubled. And if we see, uh, something changes at some point. I mean, it used to be that they had one uh, computing unit, like a CPU and add one computing core on it, 
and you would be able to make it faster and faster by increasing the computing speed, the clock. But about in 2009, people stopped increasing the clock. The clock was three gigahertz, it didn't go faster than that, and people kept uh, increasing the computational power of computers, not by increasing the clock speed, but by increasing the number of cores on a CPU, okay? Uh, so that's a big change. It allows you to dissipate uh, heat better, so you can make computers which are more powerful. And now we see, when you see the Pentium core, the Itanium, they, they have more and more cores. And now you can buy IMD chips with 16 cores, and people make machines like this one. So this is the fastest supercomputer right now, just, uh, just delivered in the US uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's 20 uh, petaflops, 12,000 nodes. Each node has one AMD Opteron and uh, one NVIDIA Tesla. And the NVIDIA Tesla is 512 cores. Okay, so you can compute how many floating point units are in there. Each core has more than one floating point unit. Okay, so it's a lot of floating point units. Um, and people build these machines for a number of things. So they do some classified simulations, they do weather forecasts, but a big chunk, like the other 50%, is lattice QCD computations. Okay, so I have colleagues who have written a lot of code that runs on this kind of machines and uh, they use CUDA. Uh, I am interested in, and CUDA is a language that works on this uh, NVIDIA uh, devices, which are part also on that supercomputer, but you can get one of these cards for your laptop, uh, for your computer. Probably your laptop may have already uh, a GPU in it. So these are just uh, uh, graphical uh, processors, and they originally were designed for graphic computations. In graphic computations, what you have, you have a lot of vectors, and you have to apply the same operation to all of the vectors, like a, process, a shift or a rotation. So they were very fast at doing that. Uh, but eventually, they went to a different architecture, like this is the NVIDIA Fermi, the latest one is the NVIDIA Tesla, and the architecture is to have a lot of cores, in this case 512, and each core basically can be executing uh, they all execute the same program, but they know in which core they're running, so they may do different things. So people came up with the idea that you can use this not just to do graphics, but you can do this to run any kind of parallel program. You, you take your data, you distribute the data over the many cores, and you give every core the same program with if statements, and you decide on which core you are, and then you do the operation that you want to do. Um, so they have a certain uh, architecture in which basically there is a memory which is shared by all the cores. Then there are groups, as you see here, and there is memory which is shared by the groups. And, and then there is memory which is associated to each individual core, which more or less is like cache memory. So uh, NVIDIA was the first manufacturer to come up with this kind of design and, uh, for consumers. And they came up with uh, this programming uh, technology called CUDA. The problem with CUDA, I mean, CUDA is great, works great on these cards, it's just that it only works on NVIDIA devices. And if you get an AMD chip today, or um, you can get chips from different manufacturers that have a similar design, you cannot use CUDA to program them. So first of all, we can see that these are benchmarks done by NVIDIA for algorithms they tweaked, so they are a little bit uh, skewed perhaps, but still it's indicative of a trend. And they compare the Intel Xeon uh, performance on different problems with the Tesla card performance. And you know that the Intel Xeon performance is this small block over here, sometimes you don't even see it. Um, and for many physics applications, people really see this big speed up. So now in science, at least in US, everybody wants to get, uh, prefer to have a card on their computer than to have access to a big supercomputer. Or they want supercomputers that do have these cards because really there's a big uh, increase in performance. Um, so basically we're going from a single core area, which was dominated by Moore's law and uh, was enabled by, uh, I mean, was kind of different to scale, and was constrained mostly by power to a multi-core area in which you still have some uh, power constraints and uh, you still have some more low, but you just add core. The problem is that in the multi-core area in which like the Intel 
uh, processors, the way you code them, you have to write threads. You have to write a program that spawns many threads, you have to write the threads, you have to synchronize the memory. It's kind of difficult to do it. Uh, in the single core area, you would scale by making many computers in a cluster and you would run uh, parallel programs uh, on the cluster with message passing uh, using some kind of interconnection. Um, most of the supercomputers until three years ago, they were a combination of the two. So you have many nodes, each node had many cores, and you would use threads with, on each node, and different nodes would communicate using matches passing. Still, it's complicated to do, and uh, now we're going to an heterogeneous system area in which we have many cores on single chip, we have many chips on one node, we have many nodes connected, so it's getting really difficult to program these machines. So we need some kind of new programming model. CUDA is very special for these cards. So what OpenCL does, OpenCL provides a way to make parallel programs that in principle run on many different types of devices. So OpenCL was created by this group, the Kronos group, and AMD is part of it, Intel is part of it, Nvidia is part of it, Apple, ARM. So all the major chip manufacturers agreed to develop this technology. It's very similar to CUDA. CUDA and OpenCL are very similar languages. CUDA is, I'm gonna go on the next slide. CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. It's a parallel computer architecture developed by NVIDIA. And OpenCL is, let's say the equivalent, uh, open standard. It's supposed to work across platform, and it's supposed to work on all modern processors, and it's adopted by all these manufacturers. Um, So what's the differences? Well, they're both very much C-like languages. So the way you program them, you write a core piece of code in C, and you deploy it on every uh, computing node that you have, on every computing core. Uh, in the case of MPCL, it's strictly C99 language with some extra, with some macro to tell where the memory should be allocated on the device. In the case of uh, CUDA, it's a little bit more sophisticated. For example, you have templates. Even if it's C, you have templates like in C++. Uh, CUDA is very well documented because it's sponsored by a large company and they heavily invested in it. Uh, OpenCL is perhaps a little less documented, but it's open. Um, CUDA is a better debugger. OpenCL, I honestly don't know. I haven't found a good way to debug code. It's complicated. I'm sure there is something. I just don't know it. Um, CUDA comes with a lot of libraries which uh, have been ported to it already, like Trust, uh, CULA, Linear Algebra, CU, BLAS, BLAS for Biology and other Linear Algebra computation, CUFFT for Fast Fourier Transform, CU Sparse for Spatz Matrix Inversions, and so on. There are many. Um, OpenCL does not uh, add that, but the plus side is that it runs on the GPU, it runs on the CPU, it runs on Android. So, I have this laptop. This laptop does not have a GPU device. It does not have a CUDA GPU device. But I still want to write my parallel programs with it, and I want to be able to debug them and try them, and then if they want, they work, I deploy on a different machine. And I cannot do that with CUDA. Instead, with OpenCL, I can do it, and that's what I'm really interested in. I want to write my parallel programs on my laptop. I want them to run on the CPU as if I had a parallel machine, and then I deploy on a machine that has GPUs. Um, so the cons in the CUDA case is run on uh, a GPU only, only on NVIDIA GPUs, and has no CPU support. And in the OpenCL case, the cons is that, well, documentation and debugger is not as good as CUDA. And also, even if many vendors support it, they don't always have the latest version of the drivers, okay? Sometimes you have older version of the drivers for some devices. Uh, Performance-wise, so this is a kind of an old test, this test is about more than one year old, but what you see is that the ratio is almost always one, so performance-wise very close. There are two tests which have to do with fast Fourier transforms in which CUDA is like six times faster than OpenCL, but that's because they optimized the coding in the CUDA case and did not try to optimize the OpenCL case. So it's not telling anything about the device, it's telling about the code that you're testing. Okay, in the other cases they did some work to optimize in both kind of uh, languages and the performance is more or less plus minus 10 percent is within a factor one. So it does not make that big of a difference if what, what you use. So uh, what's the basic idea of both CUDA and OpenCL? 
the basic idea is that you have a program that looks like this. You have uh, arrays, like A and B are arrays. You load data into one, like let's say we load data into array A. And then you have a, a loop for i equals 0, i less than n, i plus plus, which you do something with bi. I oh, I have a typo. You do something with ai, and you compute bi. OK, this is a typo. This is supposed to be ai. So you do some computation that is local. It only depends on one term of the array. Perhaps it depends on i. And uh, this means that I can process a1 at the same time and compute b1 at the same time as I process a2 and I compute b2. So this is the basic idea. That for loop can be parallelized easily, OK, in a trivial way. Um, and then I output b. So a is my input, b is the output. So the idea is to somehow take that function, do something. We call that a kernel. We parallelize it, and we use some, uh, some scheduler take care of the looping for us okay, on the devices that we have available. OK, so this is the OpenCL model, which is very much like the CUDA model. And I need to change the color here. Yeah. OK, so same code as before. We define A and B. Now we have to, to somehow take A and load into the device, whatever the device is. It can be a GPU or something else. We initialize the device. Uh, so we, we, we load the data into A. We initialize the device. And then we take the data from the RAM of the computer to the memory of the device. The device can be the GPU card, so to the memory of the GPU card. And now we run our kernel, do something, uh, on the device. And we tell it where to find A, where to find B. And each, each computational unit knows what the value of I is. Okay. So let's say i has uh, 1,000 possible values. i should loop from 0 to 1,000. And we have 500 cores. Internally, there is a scheduler that is going to submit, do something for, val for different values of i until it fills the cores. And when one course is completed, it schedules the next task automatically. OK? Does this make sense? OK. And then we copy b back from the device to the memory of the computer that we have and we output. So that's, that's a basic. Uh, Workflow. Um, so what's PyOpenCL? PyOpenCL puts together Python, NumPy, and OpenCL. Okay? It puts together these three things. So normally, the way you would do, use OpenCL is you would write a C or C++ program, and you call C or C++ functions to uh, initialize the device, copy the memory, uh, compile the kernels, deploy the kernels to the GPUs, tell the GPUs to run it. If you look at the OpenCL code, the C code is very, very verbose. It's very long. Okay? There's a lot of repetition. It's a lot of pointers passing. It's difficult. It's easy to make lots of mistakes. And in Python, we abstract all of that. So we, we write a Python program. We just store the data in NumPy arrays. Then we tell PyOpenCL to take this NumPy array and copy them to the device. We write the OpenCL core as a string of C code, and we tell it to run it on the device. Um, so the computing intensive parts are written in OpenCL, which is C99 with uh, this extra macros. And the good thing is you do this at runtime. So basically, it's a just-in-time compiler that takes these kernels in C99, compiles, and sends to the device at runtime. So that's, that's a nice feature to have, and we'll see what the advantages are. So, I'm not going to uh, use the slides for this. I'm actually going to use a demo here. So what do you need? You install NumPy. You install OpenCL. You install, well, this is something I made long ago. It's on top of matplotlib, just because I want to do some plotting. And this is, again, something I made, which we're going to use later. It's called MDPCL. OK, so this is what we want to do now. We have two arrays, A and B. We want to sum them and get the new array C, which is a, I, CI equal AI plus BI. So we're just doing a sum of two large arrays. So I'm going to make a file here. We're going to import NumPy. This array is going to have 50,000 elements. So I make A, which is a NumPy array with n random numbers, uh, stored as float to two bits. B is the same. It's another random array with uh, float to two bits. Uh, numbers. And now I, I declare C, which is another NumPy array full of zeros. And uh, this is how I do it in C. 
for GID in range 0 to n, C GID equal A GID plus B GID, and then I do the following. I, they, I use the NumPy linear algebra library to make sure that C minus A plus B is 0. The norm of that is 0. So this program should print 0 if it works. Okay, so what, what that loop is doing is computing C as A plus B, and then it's also using NumPy linear algebra to do A plus B. It's computing the difference, should get zero. Okay? Okay, so we can run it, we get zero. Now, let's rewrite this with PyOpenCL. Now, I'm not going to use exactly PyOpenCL. I'm going to add one layer in between just to make it more readable, but it's very close to PyOpenCL. So, I'm going to import this file device that we're going to write with PyOpenCL. So I'm not putting directly PyOpenCL code in here. I put PyOpenCL code in device, and I call the function in device. So the only thing I change is actually that loop. So I remove that loop, and I say device equal device. So we do some initialization. And then I make this device.buffer source equal A. So I take A, and I copy into the device, and I make A underscore buffer. I make b dot underscore buffer, which is the same thing. I take the vector b, I copy to the device, and I call it b buffer. And then I say c underscore buffer. Well, I'm not sending n to the device. I just need to tell the device that I need space for the result. OK? So I say to the device, make me a buffer of that size, uh, the number of bytes of b, the same size as b. So these functions, uh, the device constructor dot buffer, these are in my device py file that we're going to write. OK, so here we write the code. Let me write it first, and then we're going to read it. OK, so basically this is it. So the code is a string that contains C99 code that we want to run on the device. And uh, so it's a function void sum that takes a float star a, float star b, and a float star c. And uh, it does CGID equal AGID plus BGID. So it's the same code we had before in Python, but now it's in C. Uh, what are the differences? First of all, the loop is missing. Okay? So what's GID? The GID is, is going to be determined by that function, get global ID 0. So this kernel is going to be scheduled on the cores by a scheduler. And each core is going to get a different GID. OK, so one will have 0, one will have 1, one will have 2 in some order. The problem doesn't, this, the algorithm doesn't work if it's order dependent. It only works if it's order independent. You also have to tell where the memory pointed by ABC is, look, is, is stored. So when we say underscore underscore global, it means it's in the global memory of the device. So the memory which is shared by all the cores. You can do optimizations there. You can say this must go in the memory of these groups of cores. Okay, you can do all kinds of optimizations there. We're not going to do that. And then there's another thing there, underscore underscore kernel. Underscore underscore kernel say this is not just a normal C99 function. This, will, this is a kernel. This must run on, on some OpenCL device. Okay? And it's, a, it's an entry point. So it's, a, it's a, like a main for, for the program. And, uh, and then you have this. Uh, so we say the, the program is a string, and then we say program equal device.compile. So it takes this, just in time compiles into uh, a program. And then we say program.sum. So program.sum calls the function sum on the device, and we say that we want to queue it, so device.queue. So the device is a queue, so this task of summing will be queued. The device may be doing multiple operations, and you can submit many things to the queue. This brackets n, it means you want to run this kernel for every value of n from 0 to n. Okay, so this, this is what schedules all the tasks, then they go, get associated. And then you pass, this is to be none, extra parameters, forget about that. And then you pass the arguments. So you have to pass a, b, and c, but you have to pass the a, b, and c, which are on the device. So a buffer, b buffer, c buffer. Okay? So this point, uh, the computation is done, and when you're done, you retrieve the data. So from the device, you retrieve the buffer C into your C, and that's it. OK? So this is the program written with PyOpenCL. Does it make some sense? OK. So now we can run it. Oh, before we run it, we need to write device. OK? I didn't write device. 
So devices with WebPy OpenCL is NumPy. It's a class device. And uh, basically, it's a constructor. So these are the two things that you must create when, when to initialize the device. We have to say PyOpenCL creates some context and PyOpenCL common queue. So you need to create a queue and some context. Um, what does that mean? Uh, the context is it allows you to specify, you may have multiple GPUs, you may have multiple CPUs, you may have GPUs and G uh, CPUs. You may want to specify where to run, okay? So that function creates some context that allows you to do that. Uh, by default, you pass no argument, you will get whatever you have. Uh, common queue, uh, you may create multiple queues associated on your multiple devices. So we're assuming we have only one queue. Because I have two things that I need to initialize, I want my own class and I want a constructor to initialize those two things for me. Okay? Then I need the buffer. So what does this do? But basically, PyOpenCL is a PyOpenCL.buffer which creates the buffer and takes different arguments. And what I'm doing is uh, I have my device.buffer that calls the PyOpenCL buffer and passes the right parameters, like self.ctx, which is the, the context in the constructor, passes the size, it does the copy, it sets the flags, and so on. So I don't want to repeat that over and over, so I do it in there. Similarly, I have retrieve. Retrieve is the opposite operation. So make an empty output numpy array, and then ask PyOpenCL to enqueue the operation to do a copy from the buffer to the output numpy array. Okay, so this is the reverse of buffer of the previous uh, method. It's not exactly like the reverse, because when you make a buffer on the device, you can make it empty, you can copy something in it. If you copy something in it, it's done immediately. When you retrieve data from the device, you ask the device to queue a task to copy the data when it's done. Okay? So only when the device is done doing other things, it will start copying the data back. And you return this output. Then we have compile. Again, this just uh, takes the, the kernel, which is a string. It calls pyopencl.program and it's done in two steps. First, you wrap the kernel into this program uh, method, and then you call this dot build thing, which basically gives you back the program that you can run. So because it's two steps, I like to make it in one step, and that's it. So this is the entire device file, okay? It just wraps this API in a way that's a little more readable for, for us, because we're going to use them over and over. Okay, so now I can run my example, and yeah, that's it. So you run with, with OpenCL. Okay? If I had a GPU, it would be running a GPU. If I had multiple devices, the create context would prompt me which device I want to use. Um, okay, so now we want to do something a little bit more complicated. We want to solve the Laplace equation. And let me <coughs> explain what I'm trying to do. So this is what I want to do now. Uh, I have, uh, on, the, on the left hand side, you, you don't see, but there are dots, okay? So I imagine that I have this box, which is like uh, you know, 300 by 300 pixels. And uh, at random places, I have uh, electrical charges, plus one or minus one. And I want to saw, and that's, that's Q, that's Q of X. Q of X is zero everywhere. Q of X is one when there is a, a, a positive charge. It's minus one when there's a negative charge. And I want to solve, uh, nabla u equal q, where u is the electrostatic potential. So I want to find the electrostatic potential, okay? And I want to do it in two dimensions. So this is the kind of problem which is perfect for this device. It's the kind of problem that people do in physics all the time. In QCD, it's in four dimensions. Normally, people do it in like three dimensions. <coughs> so, how do we do that? First, we have to rewrite that in code. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to take space, and I'm going to, it's two dimensional, so I'm going to approximate with a mesh, okay? And every point is going to have coordinates x, comma, y. And these are integers, okay? Uh, so if this point is x, comma, y, this is x, y plus h. This is x plus h, comma, y. This is x comma y minus h, 
and this is x minus h comma y, right? These are the coordinates of the four points. Okay, so I take my Laplace equation. First of all, I expand it. So what does this mean? It means the second derivative in x plus the second derivative in y. And u means u at x, y, and q means q at x, y, okay? Now, I know that what's the derivative, a second derivative in this point of, a fun of something u? Well, it's the value of u here plus the value of u here minus twice the value of u here, okay? That's a way to approximate the derivative if you're in a discretized space. So the second derivative in y is that. It's u at y plus h minus twice u at y plus y, u at y plus minus h. Same thing with the second derivative in x of u. is u at x plus h, which is on the right, minus u at y, which is the center, plus u at x minus h, which is on the left. Now I take these two, I replace them in here, I get this long thing. So I get u at x plus h comma y plus u x comma y plus h and so on. Notice that I have a minus 2u, I have a minus 2u, I get a minus 4u. Okay, so I solve this in uh, u of x, y. So I just bring this on one side and everything else on the other side. And I get u at x, y is 1 fourth. This 4 is 1 fourth and everything else. And okay, that's something I can write in a piece of code, right? So how do I solve it? I iterate that until I converge. So I need the loop, and I keep iterating that. Uh, also, I need to be a little careful, because I'm using u on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So I don't want to overwrite something I'm using on the right-hand side. So what do I do? I create a temporary array w, and uh, I evaluate the right-hand side. So u up, plus u down, plus u left, plus u right, minus q at the side, so this q. Site is the center, up, down, left, right are the four neighbors. And I store the new value in W. And when I'm done, I couple W into U back. So I, I don't have problems with overwriting variables. And uh, so this formula I end up with is kind of specific for this Laplace uh, problem. But there's something which is very general here. And uh, in every physics problem, you have uh, equations that are continuous in space. I Meaning in physics, information travels through space. So the effect of something needs to travel to get to a point. So whatever happens here must depend on the neighbors, cannot depend on something which is far away. Okay? So you can always write many, the solution to many physics problems, not quite all of them, but most of them, as the value of a field at one point equal a function of the value of another field at the neighbors, and iterate. You can solve almost any differential equation with the same technology. OK, so <clears throat> let's code that. So we take the same code we had before, and we go make some changes. Um, so one change is, instead of the device that uses this MDPCL library, it includes the same class device, OK? Exactly the same. So uh, no change there. Uh, in, I include Canvas because I want to make images. I include Random. I'm not sure why I include random. OK, I'll leave it there. Um, OK, we're going to make n equal 300. And we're going to make q to be an array of uh, zeros, n by n. OK, n is a two-dimensional array of zeros. And uh, u is a two-dimensional array of zeros. And w is a two-dimensional array of zeros. And uh, this is what you do for k in range n, so for 300 values, we put a random x, a random y, and q at that random point is a random choice between minus 1 and plus 1. So I'm picking the random charges, OK? Um, now I take q and I copy to the device. I take uh, u and I copy to the device. And I take w and I copy to the device. And now I change my program. So now I call my kernel solve. It takes w and u. And it must implement that function. And also takes q. Now what changes here? It changes that the problem is not one dimensional, but it's two dimensional. And the, good th the nice thing about OpenCL is that when I queue tasks, I don't need to use necessarily one index. I can use two indices or three indices to queue tasks. So I can have it 
when it, when it scatters the tasks, each task is not going to know just one index. It's going to know both x and y. So it's going to know x and y, and it can get them from this calls to OpenCL functions, get global ID 0, get global ID 1. So this task knows on which vertex of the mesh it's working on. So it computes the position in the array of that element by saying y times the number of points in a row plus x, and then computes up, down, left, right. First of all, if it's on the border of the mesh, don't do anything. Otherwise, compute up, down, left, and right. And this is the algorithm, right? W of the site is 1 over 4, u up, plus u down, plus u left, plus u right, minus q site. And up is the site shifted by uh, a row. Down is a site shifted down by a row. Left is a site minus 1. Right is the site plus 1. And just shift the index. So site is the position in the array, like u site, u, uh, u site, or w site. Site is the index in the array that corresponds to x, y. Okay, so if I do site plus one, I get x plus one y. I get the next point. So this is the same equation. Does this make sense? This is as complicated as it gets, okay? Uh, so we, here's where we see the, the advantage of having a just-in-time compiler. I need to pass this thing, what's n? How big is this array? Now, I could pass other, arguments to that function, but they are constants from the point of view of this program. I mean, from the Python program, it's a variable, but from the point of view of the C99 program, it's a constant. So what I can do, I can just take the string and manipulate the string, like I replace width with uh, the value of n, and then compile with just-in-time compiler. So I can, what I'm really doing here is I'm, I'm building C99 code in Python and then run it, and I'm just in time, it, I'm basically building the code programmatically. And here we do the iteration, so we call solve. And now I solve it, uh, so Q that kernel on a Q that is two dimensional, so make many kernels, n by n kernels. And uh, because the, my grid is n by n, 300 by 300. I pass W, I pass U, and I pass Q. Uh, well, one thing you may see is that I miss U site equal W site, because that should be another loop, right? should be another in another separate loop. So I could create another kernel for that, or I can be smart, and I can just say, OK, after you've done this, swap u and w. So instead of copying w back to u, I just swap them. So at the next iteration, u is w, and I keep doing that. OK, so done. I retrieve my u buffer. I retrieve it as a n by n object. And then I take my canvas library, I show, image show, this shows a 2D thing, and I save it as plot PNG. And we run it. And we see plot PNG, That's, that, there it is. Uh, if I go to my slides, I can also show you, okay, you can see I, the computation is going because I've done it before and I saved every step. I'm not sure when it's done. <laughs> okay, we will leave it at that. Okay, so <clears throat> is this the end of the story? Uh, from the point of view of PyOpenCL, where there are more APIs, but that's basically it. Okay, so from the point of view of uh, PyOpenCL, um, that's what it does. So you copy data to it from the device, you compile C99, you run it on the device. So it's really easy to use. Um, but then uh, I started to think there are these really nice libraries over there that do some really nice things. One is called Cyton. Cyton, you decorate a Python function, and when you run it, it runs a C version of the function. So it takes Python, compiles it to C, and runs it in C. Some people have tried to do that with OpenCL, and there's this library called Clyther, uh, which basically does the same with OpenCL. So you take a a Python function, you just write it in Python, you put the decorator, and it's supposed to run on the device. Now, I could not make that work on my laptop. And uh, so that's, I tried to rewrite that. that. That's where this project comes from. And then there's pyjamas. Pyjama is something where you write Python code, and then you say, I want it in JavaScript, and converts to you in JavaScript. So I figured out these three things have something in common. What they are doing, they're all doing the same thing. You're taking 
They're taking Python code and they're converting to something else and then they're running something else and you're getting a result, right? So I try to say, like, can we abstract that? Can we do a library that performs these tasks for me? And uh, um, so what we're going to do in our code, we're going to replace device with MDPCL, which includes device, but also includes this, some other stuff. And the goal is to write Python code that generates OpenCL code from Python runtime and by using a decorator. And you can install it with uh, is installed. But also, since, since we are there, why just generate OpenCL code? Why not generate any C code or JavaScript code or perhaps something else? So this was written for Scratch, basically. It does not use those libraries. And it's a little smaller, so it's more readable. And uh, well, let's do it again. OK, so what's the thing? We, we had this big uh, string that I don't like. I want to get rid of that. So I'm going to use a decorator, say, add device.compiler. This is going to be a kernel. This kernel is going to take a variable w, a variable u, and a variable q. Let me write all of it first, and then we, we, we see what happens. OK, so there is no more big string in there. There is no uh, C99. Well, it is still C99, but it's written using the Python syntax as opposed to the, uh, to the C99 syntax. So my function solve is now created in Python. Take w, u, and q. And uh, it does the same thing. w site equal 1 over 4, u up, u down, and so on. And uh, it's the same logic. Up is site minus n, uh, down is site plus n, and so on. And I take this Python function, and I decorate it with at device compiler kernel. So I say, this is a, this is a kernel that runs on this device. And I have to tell what the arguments are, because this is going to be translated in C. So it wants to know what kind of types. So w is a pointer to float decorated with global. It's a, u is a pointer to float constant decorated with global. q is a pointer to float constant decorated with global. Also, this is going to be converted in C. So in C, variables must be declared. So you have to tell it uh, what, what's x. It's a new integer. Okay? So it will get translated in int x equal get global semicolon. So get global id does not exist in this Python program. I never imported it. It's not defined. That function, I cannot even call it in Python. But this gets converted in real time in in C99, and then I say device.compile, and I pass the constants. I say I want the constants n equal n. So it takes the n which exists in the Python code, it moves it into the solve function which runs the device, which knows what n is now. So now I, don't, I have an easier way to pass, to pass code to it, and then I can run it. Does it make sense what we're trying to do? OK. So we can exit this, and again, we can run it, and Oh, uh, well, I, we get the same output, so I, I don't show it to you. Well, since we are on it, well, let's try something else with it. So let me take this compiler from this library without the device. Uh, let me create this C99 object, it's just a variable name. I use this decorator, and I create a function factorial n. Function factorial n takes an integer and uh, computes the factorial, right? OK. And now I say, Take this object, which has decorated the factorial function, compile it, like it compiled. And uh, now if I call factorial 10, it calls the Python function. But if I call compile.factorial10, copies, it calls the Python function, convert it to C, reimport it back, and runs the C version of it. OK? So how, how does that work inside? Um, Inside, what the decorator is doing is doing introspection of the code. It's taking the code and converting it to abstract uh, syntax tree. It takes the abstract syntax tree, serializes in C99, uh, writes that into a temporary module, imports the modules. OK, that's how it's doing it, which is the same way uh, I think Cyton does. I'm not completely sure because I've not really looked at it, but I believe it's very similar. Um, and uh, so we can exit and run this. OK, and we get the same output. Um, we can also do this now. Uh, 
I can take the same thing. Instead of C99, I call uh, JS. And instead of compiler, I import uh, something called uh, uh, Java script handler. And here I say that the handler is the Java script handler. And uh, when I'm done, I just print JS translate, JS convert. Uh, make type. What did I do wrong? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure what I did wrong, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get Okay, so you can look for this on GitHub and <coughs> uh, so same thing here. And when you say JS convert, you will get it converted to JavaScript. And you can look at the code, it's only five hundred lines, so it's relatively Simple. Use a library called Meta, which is really it's a third-party library, which is really great because it, what it does, it basically takes Python code, converts to AST, and I can show you how that works because that's really interesting. Uh, okay, so this is the basic idea of Meta, and so I'm going to import it. Let me create a function f. And what this function f says a equal 1 and says return a. And what we do now is say uh, c equal decompile function f. And now I print uh, import ast, which is a Python module. And I print ast dump this thing c. And what it did, it introspected the function f. It said that there is a function definition for a function called f, which takes these arguments. And then it contains a body, which is a list. The first thing is an assignment when the target is called a, and the value is a number equal to 1. And the second thing is a return, where the value that we return is a name i. And uh, so what, what the library does, it calls this meta library, builds this AST, and then traverses the AST, and serializes it in C99, OpenCL, JavaScript. In principle, you can extend it. And well, that's it. And can you see the converted C code? Yes. Uh, basically, OK, let me. I mean, is, is that stored in, in the file system? You can. Uh, um, so there is. There's two functions here. One is convert, and one is compile. So convert takes the, the Python code and gives you the, the converted code. Compile internally calls convert and then runs it as well, if, if it can. Like JavaScript, it wouldn't run it, but C99 it will run it. And uh, so if you just call convert yourself, uh, you, you would get the code out. You have to specify some parameters, like uh, when you call convert, Is it? Yeah, you have to specify, like if it's C code, if you want headers or not, uh, if you want to pass constants. So constants are passed like a dictionary. And uh, if, uh, if it's JavaScript, you may want to specify if the function should be called. Typically, if you generate JavaScript, you also want to call the function. So you, you specify the name of the functions to be called after you, they are defined. Um, so this is really recent, so I'm actually uh, looking for comments. So if any of you wants to give it a try and send me comments and suggestions for improvement, that, that would be really valuable. Yes? I don't know if it's or not. The, uh, the first thing I thought when you said you can use C code here is that uh, the, the, the 
is it just a connection of hydrogen for Python and for Python? Yes. Uh, is that useful here? No, this is a completely different thing. Okay. Because, okay, PyPy, the goal of PyPy uh, is, yes. PyPy right? yeah, uh, is not that converted to C code. It's converted to machine language. Okay. Well, to, it's converted to some internal virtual machine language. I thought it would go from uh, Python to C code and then to machine language. It is possible. Uh, okay. It is po uh, you, you talk about PyPy? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if internally it goes to C code first. I don't know. It's possible. But the goal of PyPy is to take any Python code and convert it to machine language. Uh, our goal, no, is to, uh, I cannot write any Python code here. My goal is the opposite. I want to be able to write any C code using the Python syntax. So I, I cannot put a dictionary in there. Uh, like I can put a list or a dictionary if it's converted to JavaScript, because in JavaScript it exists. But if I put a dictionary list in there and I try to convert to C, it will not do it because there is no equivalent in C. So it just converts the syntax. It does not convert um, the data types or, or, or the functions. It assumes the functions you call already exist in the target. So it's much simpler in scope. This is 500 lines. PyPy is a big project. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.